in the first talk we talked about the dangers of selfishness and then in the second talk we discussed the cause of selfishness as well as the foundations of selfishness in yesterday's talk we talked about the dis the extinguishing of selfishness today we will discuss the benefits the value of extinguishing selfishness when we speak about the the fruit or benefits of extinguishing selfishness we'd like to bring up one thai word word which ought to be of interest to you in thai this word is anisong which comes from the pali word ani sang sa the meaning of this word is the milk that flows out of the flowing milk when we milk a cow then the the milk the nutritious milk flows out from the cow's udder this is the literal meaning of the word ani song so today we'll talk about the ani song of extinguishing selfishness when we talk about the ani song of getting rid of selfishness the most simple way to t- put it is to say that happiness is the the benefit of extinguishing selfishness but when we use this word happiness we must be a bit careful because happiness is a very vague and uncertain word people give it all kinds of different meanings and so we will clarify what is meant by the word happiness we'll take a good look at this word at first we'll we can at least see that there are two kinds of happiness the happiness of everyday people language and the happiness of dhamma language the word happiness in people language by people language we mean the the common everyday meaning in terms of people and persons in people language happiness is something that we can get drunk on we can become infatuated with it go crazy over it get lost in it and it this is very important it bites its owner this is the happiness of people language the happiness that is intoxicating infatuating the <clears throat> very tricky and which in the end bites its owner if we look closely this happiness in people the happiness of people language this common ordinary happiness isn't true happiness what it really is is a kind of pleasure which deceives and tricks it's a kind of entertaining luscious attractive pleasure which deceives this is what most people take to be happiness this this tricky pleasure this deceiving pleasure is always ready to to become a bait it's always ready to become bait to catch us and trap us and so all the worldlings who are chasing after these deceptive pleasures are being trapped by these this bait and this is the state of of worldlings being deceived and and lured by the bait of worldly pleasure or deceptive pleasures this is this is happiness in people language 
this worldly happiness is always something material and physical. It depends on bodies and material objects. It's not a mental or spiritual kind of happiness. And therefore, this kind of deceptive pleasures are very expensive. They're very difficult and there's, they're a real pain in the neck to acquire and to keep. And so it leads to all kinds of busyness, competition, and problems for the worldlings who are chasing after these, this worldly happiness. And the last point to be made about this people language happiness is that it is the basis of selfishness. As soon as people indulge in these deceptive pleasures, it becomes selfishness and creates all the problems associated with selfishness. Now let's look at the opposite kind of happiness. This happiness is not intoxicating or infatuating. It doesn't make us crazy and it doesn't bite the one who possesses it. It doesn't bite the one who has it. Be very, be very careful about this point. This kind of happiness is not a deceptive pleasure. It doesn't trick or deceive. But the ordinary worldling overlooks it. Common, common people overlook this genuine, true happiness. So let's take a good look at it. This kind of happiness is not a bait. It doesn't lure us and trap us. This genuine happiness is pure, bright, clear, calm, and it leads to peace. It is not a bait which entraps or deceives. This, this kind of happiness isn't at all expensive. It doesn't cost any money or any material difficulties. There are no hassles and problems associated with this kind of happiness. It's free. And the most important point is that this kind of happiness does not lead to selfishness. It does not support or nourish selfishness. In Thai, there's a, a very nice pun. The word suk, which means happiness, has two spellings. One spelling means happiness. And the other kind of, the other spelling means well done. Both kinds of suk have the same sound and pronunciation, but the meaning is different. And so we use this to point out the difference between the two kinds of happiness. Genuine happiness is cool and calm. It doesn't lead to selfishness. The false kind of happiness, which means well done, is hot. So the easiest way to translate in this into English is hot happiness and cool happiness. This hot happiness is dependent on the defilements, greed, anger, delusion, and so forth. It needs their help in order to be happy. Cool happiness has nothing to do with the defilements. It doesn't need their help at all. For hot happiness to realize its aim, it needs to use and get help from the defilements. And this is why it's hot. But genuine cool happiness has nothing to do with the defilements. It doesn't need their help, and so it can be very cool and soothing. This hot happiness depends on all kinds of material goods. 
And when people become infatuated with this kind of defiled happiness, then they set about trying to acquire possessions, material objects, in all kinds of luxuries. This is the kind of happiness with which the world is infatuated, all, everyone chasing after various kinds of luxuries, spending all kinds of money in pursuit of what they take to be happiness, this hot, deceptive happiness. The other kind of happiness, cool happiness, doesn't cost a penny or a fenning or a mark or whatever currency. It costs absolutely nothing for this kind of happiness. It's a mental, spiritual happiness which has nothing to do with material things. And so when one overcomes selfishness, or when one is able to concentrate the mind correctly, when one practices mindfulness of breathing correctly and properly, then there arises this, this genuine cool happiness which doesn't deceive or trick and it doesn't cost a penny. So if we talk in economic terms, there is the happiness that costs money and the happiness that doesn't cost a penny. Which one are you interested in? Now that we've made it clear the difference between hot and cool happiness, we'd like to focus on the happiness of Dhamma, this cool happiness. Even though we can say the happiness of Dhamma, there are different levels to it, or there are different kinds of Dhammic happiness with different qualities and characteristics. So we'd like to talk about these different levels of true happiness. The first level of Dhammic happiness is the happiness that comes from non-harming or non-violence. When there is no harm being done, then there arises this first kind of happiness. In Pali, there is the phrase, apayapa chang sukhang loke panna pute su sanyamo. sanyamo. <coughs> this means that non-harming, non-harming is happiness within this world. When, when we live here with aware that we are not harming ourselves, any other people, any other creatures, or the environment, when we are aware of a life and lifestyle that is not harming anything, is not exploiting or violating anything, then there arises this first kind of happiness. With this word, non-harming, or harming, we have to be very careful. Many people take a one-sided view of it. When we talk about harm, there are two sides of it. One is we can harm ourselves, and the other is harm others. When there is genuine non-harming, neither side is harmed or violated. There is no, nobody is being afflicted. But sometimes we get confused on this, and in order to help others, we harm ourselves. And then, of course, there is often the kind of helping oneself by harming or exploiting others. But in true non-harming, true non-violence, there is no harming of either ourselves or others. When there is this complete non-harming, then there arises genuine happiness. We like to say that the more one loves oneself, the more one harms oneself. Or the more one is selfish, the more one harms oneself. When one loves oneself, this love makes, makes us blind, and then we indulge in those deceptive pleasures which lead us astray. We go through all kinds of ridiculous difficulties to get some trifling pleasure. And this is how we harm ourselves because of this, 
this self-love. The more stupid we are, the more we harm ourselves. And when there's this stupid, foolish self-love, then we harm ourselves immensely, wasting our time on these trifling, deceptive pleasures and overlooking true happiness. And so the more selfish we are, the more we harm ourselves. When we come to harming others, we probably don't have to say very much about it because the world, world is full of this. People, selfishness, leading to people harming others for their own selfish benefit. When we selfishly see something as beneficial or advantageous to ourselves, then we're, we're completely willing to go and take advantage of someone else to exploit or harm another for our own advantage. And the world is, is full of this. There's this exploitation all around, underground, above ground, in, in small ways and in big ways, such that people are even trying to take advantage of the whole world. Sometimes we cut the world into two halves and each half is trying to harm the other half. Or sometimes we try and take harm the whole world and this this exploitation and affliction sometimes even starts to think about other worlds to go over and conquer other planets and worlds in order to take advantage of those worlds this kind of selfish harming knows no limits it's limitless when there is no selfishness then nothing is harmed. Merely by re removing selfishness, all this violence and exploitation can be destroyed. When there is no selfishness, we don't harm ourselves. There is no harming of others. Even the animals are not harmed. We can even go so far as saying that even the ground, the soil, the earth is not harmed when selfishness is removed. When this selfishness is extinguished and there is none of this harming, then it becomes very natural to, to relate to others in terms of the what are called the divine dwellings, friendliness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. And then this is the basis for Dhammic happiness. Those of you who value this teaching of the four divine abodes, Metta, Garuna, Mudita, and Ubeka, you should focus on this one thing of removing selfishness. If you are interested in Metta, universal love or friendliness. Garuna, compassion. Mudita, sympathetic joy. And Ubeka, equanimity. Then all you need to do is direct your attention to unselfishness or selflessness. When there is no selfishness, then there is metta automatically. There is this very spontaneous love for everything. There is spontaneous garuna, the desire to help, to be of service, or compassion. There is spontaneous joy at the happiness of others. And there is ubeka, when it is not possible to help at this moment, then with ubeka it's to wait, await the opportunity to help and serve. Some people understand this last divine abode incorrectly. They take ubeka to mean to, to be indifferent, to be indifferent when we can't do anything to help. But true ubeka is to observe and wait, await an opportunity to help if there's no opportunity right at this moment. So if you value these four Brahma viharas, four divine abodes, then focus your attention on not being selfish. This 
last Brahma Vihara, Ubeka, is often a source of confusion. Ubeka means to look at, to observe, to watch. Some people think it means to close our eyes and not pay attention, to be indifferent. That's, that's silly and of no value or benefit. Ubeka means to look at, to observe. If everyone in the world would look, keep looking for opportunities to help others, for opportunities to serve others, then there wouldn't be any of these crises in the world that there is these days. So please be especially interested in Ubeka, looking, observing for opportunities to help and serve. This is the the fundamental or basic level of happiness that arises when there is no harming, neither harming oneself or anyone or anything else. Then there arises this fundamental kind of happiness. This happiness arises when there is no harming and that comes from not being selfish. At first this may seem illogical to you that by not being selfish there arises happiness. Many people have the warped kind of logic that by being selfish we become happy, by being selfish we help ourselves, but this betrays a fundamental ignorance about life. When we remove, it, it may sound illogical, but by removing selfishness when there is no selfishness. This is what benefits us. This is what is to our advantage. If we look carefully, we see that it's selfishness with, which burns our minds so that even if we're all by ourselves, this selfishness is constantly disturbing us so that we can't even sleep well at night. And this constantly thinking of oneself thinking in terms of oneself, this egocentricity gives us all kinds of headaches, it leads to all sorts of neuroses, it makes us go crazy, even to the point that many people are killing themselves because of selfishness. This sounds strange to many people that suicide is essentially a selfish act, but this is how, this is because selfishness in itself is very stupid and so it leads to all kinds of stupid and ignorant results including suicide. If you study all the suicides in the world, if you look beyond the superficial causes and look really deep, you'll see the fundamental cause of suicide is selfishness. Selfishness leads to not being able to sleep at night. Egocentrism leads to headaches and neuroses Selfishness even leads to harming ourselves in such an extreme way as suicide. Only, the only way to stop harming ourselves is to end selfishness. As long as there is selfishness, we harm ourselves and others. This is something you really ought to examine as carefully as you can. And now we'll come to the second level of Dhammic happiness. This is the happiness that comes from being without lust. When there is no lust, the absence of lust is a higher level of happiness. Everyone knows what lust means. To remove lust, to remove, remove sexual greed and sensual greed is a higher kind of happiness. In Bali there are the words vira, sukha, vira kata, loke, kama nang samatik kamo. Sukha, vira kata, loke, kama nang samatik kamo. Which means <laughs> by eliminating lust within the world or towards the world, this surpasses the, the happiness that comes from being free of lust 
towards the world surpasses the happiness of sensuality. This is a higher kind of, of happiness. When the mind is free of this sensual lust, then it is even more happier, calmer, and cooler. This word lust has a broader meaning than most people understand. And though this may be a little bit beyond your immediate needs, we'd like to mention it. Most people think that lust has only to do with sex or things related to sex. This is their, the narrow understanding of the word lust or in Thai the word raka, which can mean also passion, a very passionate, excited kind of love. But lust can, has a much, actually lust has a much broader meaning than that. Sexual lust is only the first level. There can be also lust towards material objects, which isn't so much a sensual lust, but just the lust to possess, to, to have material things. And then there's an even third level of lust, which doesn't have much to do with material, physical things. The lust for power, for influence, for fame, for honor, and things like this, for immat immaterial things. This is also a kind of lust. So try and understand the word lust in this broader, broader way. And when all three kinds or levels of lust can be removed, then there is a very great happiness in being free of these, these levels of lust. But even if you can just remove the, the crudest sexual kind of lust, by being free of that lust is in itself a great deal of happiness. The stronger that selfish is, selfishness is, the stronger lust will be. And as selfishness decreases and lessens, then lust also abates and decreases. So the more, the more powerful and strong selfishness is, the more powerful lust is and all its agitation. But by, by lessening and eliminating selfishness, then there can arise the, the happiness of being free of lust. So by, once again, by lessening and overcoming selfishness, then there comes the higher level of happiness that is being without, that is to live without lust. Often, people teach that the way to remove lust, to overcome lust, is to contemplate repulsive things, to contemplate ugly and loathsome, loathsome things. So it's often advised to people with a lot of lust to go to a summer cemetery or cremation ground and contemplate the corpses or the remains of, of corpses. These various quite unattractive and repulsive things are a traditional technique for lessening lust. Now that's right in its own way. It's correct and it can help. But the, the most efficient and powerful way to eliminate lust is to remove selfishness. Because even going to the cemetery, if that includes any selfishness, then still there will be kinds of lust. There will be some lust remaining. So the best way to eliminate lust is to eliminate selfishness. If you want to contemplate corpses or other unattractive, repulsive things to help the removing of selfishness, that would be probably that might be a good idea. But the essential thing is to remove selfishness. 
By removing selfishness, then there is nothing on which lust can stand. Selfishness is the basis, the foundation of lust. If we take away that basis, then there could be no, no lust. So this is the best way to be free of lust by becoming free of selfishness. So the second kind of happiness is that which comes when we are free of, of lust. This is the kind of happiness that arises because the mind or life is no longer disturbed and hassled by lust. Often we can't sleep well at night because of lust in either a cruder or more refined form. Lust keeps us from sleeping well at night or sometimes it prevents us from sleeping at all. And it can disturb us, hassle us, throughout the day. This kind of lust exists and there is also a way of removing it merely by removing selfishness. And then there arises this second level of happiness, the happiness of being without raka, without lust. Now we come to the third level of happiness or the, the last level of happiness. This is the happiness of being completely free of all selfishness when all selfishness is absolutely and completely removed, eliminated, extinguished. This is the kind of happiness that surpasses the world. This happiness is above the world. It is not trapped within worldly conditions. When there is absolutely no selfishness, then there can arise no defilements. When there is no selfishness, then the mind is beyond the world. It's no longer caught within the world. And so worldly conditions, there's, there's nothing in the world that can have influence over the mind. There's nothing in the world that can make the mind greedy or angry or hateful or afraid or worried or any other kind of defiled reactions. The mind is free of all these things and this is the kind of happiness which is above the world or which surpasses the world. The Pali sentence which expresses this third kind of happiness is asami manatsa vinayo etang we paramang sukham. What this means is by leading or by removing asami mana, by removing asami mana, there is removing asami mana completely is the highest happiness why we'll have to explain a few of these words asami mana you've been hearing about over and over again this is to regard things as i as me as mine as self so by removing self view by re removing the idea that there is a self, personality belief, whatever you want to call it, I, self, soul, ego, no matter what name you call it, it's the basis of selfishness. By removing the belief in self, the view of self, this is the highest, the supreme happiness. Why? The word woi means hooray. something like hooray or hurrah. It's a cry of victory when, when a supreme accomplishment has been accomplished. When there is the highest kind of victory and success, then in Thai the kind of call would be woi or something like that. 
<laughs> so, removing all self-view is the highest happiness. Hooray! But woy is a lot more than hooray. It's it's the supreme call of triumph, of victory. This is the highest happiness. Asami manatsa vinayo etang we paramang sukang. Sukang means happiness. Paramang means supreme, the highest happiness. This woy is a little more than than hooray because it's also a challenge. It's like shaking shaking one's fist at at selfishness in triumph at having defeated selfishness. We'd like to discuss the word loguttara. Log or loka means world. Uttara means to be above or beyond. So loguttara means above, beyond the world. This doesn't mean getting into a spaceship and flying off into space because no matter where we went, that would still be the world. Any place, no matter how far away, is still the world. Loguttara, above the world, doesn't have anything to do with our body. This means for the mind to be above worldly conditions. We can't escape the world. We must live in it. But the mind needn't be trapped under the influence of good and bad, winning and losing, getting and missing, positivism, negativism, and all those worldly qualities and values. Living in the world, even if we were under the ground, the mind can still be above the world, can still exist beyond the world. This is the meaning of Loguttara. It's something mental and spiritual it has. It's not a physical being above, floating around in some spaceship. To make it even more simple and short, we can sim just say that I, the ego, is the world. This concept of I, of ego, this is the meaning of the world. To be above that egoistic idea, that concept, is to be above the world. Another way to explain Loguttara is to be above the misunderstanding of duality. The world is full of dualistic things because the world is full of foolish people. People, foolish people, understand that there are dualistic things, good and bad, winning and losing, positive and negative, and so forth. This is a, a misunderstanding. In reality, all things are the same. Good and bad is the same, positive and negative is the same. It's just a process of the law of Itapajayada. Itapajayada means because this exists, this arises. Because this disappears, this disappears. More simply, it's the law of cause and effect or the law of conditionality. Because of this process, this flow, of causes and effects of itapajayata. This is all there is. There is really neither good nor bad, positive or negative. But fools misunderstand this, the fundamental reality, and discriminate things as positive and negative, and then are trapped by this misunderstanding. To be loguttara above the world is to realize how things truly are, that good and bad is the same thing, and not to be, and then to be free of all those dualistic misunderstandings which lead to attachment, indulgence, selfishness, and all the problems which we have 
discussed. So, Lokutara, being above the world, is being above the misunderstanding of dualism, of duality, that there are pairs of opposites, such as positive and negative. <clears throat> and a simple example that should be easy for us all to understand is the example of hot and cold. Hot and cold are really not a dualistic opposite or a dualistic opposition as most people think. If we've learned anything about science, we realize that hot and cold are just differences in temperature and that hot and cold are not absolutely true. That in a lump of ice, for example, there is just a certain degree of temperature, there's a certain amount of temperature. And then in the sun, there is just a different level or degree of temperature. The, the words hot and cold are not absolutely true, they only have relative meaning. There's really just differences in temperature. Or even day and night. A child thinks that day and night are completely different. But really day and night are all the same thing. It's just time, just differences in time, changing time. There's no absolute truth to day and night. When someone sees the world this way, instead of getting caught in the, the dualisms, making things into opposites, then no one, one is no longer trapped in left or right. The mind is in the middle, free and unattached. This, this is the mind or the life that is above the world, to be no longer caught up in dua, duality, no longer caught up in hot and cold, left and right, and so forth, but to be in the middle, to be above the world, to be free of worldly conditions. and then none of those conditions can trick or deceive the mind into attachment, selfishness, and suffering. Or such is the pair as gaining and losing. When something, this is another dualism that is, exists in worldly minds, that there is gain and loss. But this, such a thing doesn't really exist. There is merely the stream, the flow of itapajayata. When certain conditions exist, then this result arises. And, or when these conditions exist, then there will be this result, this effect. It all just depends on conditions and causes which lead to certain effects. And then this, this flow of cause and effect, this process just keeps flowing onward and onward. There's nothing that is really gaining or losing. These are just words, dualities, illusions created within worldly minds. People go and say, oh, this is profit, that is loss, and then they get all excited about these things. But it's yes. really just the flow of cause an effect. Not seeing things in these terms is to be above the world, to no longer be trapped in these dualistic conditions. Or what about when you laugh and when you cry? When positivism makes you laugh and negativism makes you cry. Have you ever examined, examined this matter? When the mind, when we really see things as they are, there is no longer these positive and negatives to make us laugh and cry. We can just observe whatever takes place without laughing and crying. Or are you worried that that wouldn't be any fun, that that wouldn't be very enjoyable, that it might be boring or something? Take a good look. This is what 
the, this is the happiness that is Loguttara, above the world, to not have to laugh and cry at positive and negative, to no longer laugh and cry about worldly conditions. Is this the kind of happiness that you're interested in? When there is no positivism and no negativism, then there is what we call sunyata, voidness. Voidness is when there is no more positive and negative, when there is no more dualism, when the mind is free of all those dualistic illusions, then there is voidness or sunyata. Can any of you fit or can any of you classify voidness as positive? Or can you classify voidness as negative? In fact, sunyata, voidness, is neither positive or negative. It is beyond, above, surpassing both positive and negative. This is the meaning of Nibbana or Nirvana, which is unsurpassed voidness. Nibbana is the supreme voidness that is absolutely, that absolutely transcends positive and negative, that is free, void, empty of all dualism. When the mind perceives, when the mind sees and realizes voidness, then the mind itself is void. Because when the mind is realizing or is seeing voidness, then it doesn't, it doesn't see anything that it can attach to as good or bad. There's nothing to grab onto as positive or negative. And so the mind then is void as well. When the mind is void, that is the supreme happiness. There is no happiness which, is, which comes even close to this, this truest, most genuine happiness, the happiness of voidness. This is the happiness of freedom. When the mind is completely liberated from all the things which have power over it, which influence it, which trap it, which push its buttons, and so forth. This is the highest happiness, the happiness of voidness. This kind of voidness doesn't just happen after many, many years of practice, of training, but you probably haven't noticed it yet. But in fact, in everyone's life, there are moments if only a very short moment when the mind is free, when the mind is void of any feeling of positive or negative, when the mind is not clinging to anything as good or bad. This is a sample, a free sample or specimen of Nibbana, of the complete, perfect voidness. But people tend to overlook these. They don't pay any attention because they're so busy chasing after the deceptive pleasures. So please start to pay attention. Be on the look for these moments when the mind is free, when the mind is void of positive and negative. And once we begin to see just, just a split second of this voidness, when we begin to really realize what it is, then we turn our lives towards this voidness and set out, truly, genuinely set out on the path to Nibbana, to a life that is void, that is above worldly conditions. So don't overlook these free samples of Nibbana, which life, which nature, gives to us, and then you will begin to understand this highest 
most genuine happiness. To summarize, when the mind, when there is selfishness, then the mind is not void. But when there is no selfishness, then the mind is void and free. So please start to be very interested in this matter that we've been discussing. These moments of voidness is something we, when the mind is completely free of selfishness, is something to be very concerned and interested with. These momentary little samples of voidness that occur coincidentally in life, generally these are ignored and so we need to pay attention to them. Often they happen while we're asleep and so we just keep on sleeping and don't notice them. But we can also learn or practice to be aware of them while awake. Not, and not just these coincidental moments of emptiness, but through the practice of concentration and insight, through correct meditation in concentration and insight, then there will be deeper and further understanding of these moments of voidness. Please take special interest in this matter of the mind being void of selfishness. Understand what it means to be void, to be empty of selfishness in a way that doesn't depend on using drugs such as heroin or LSD. There are much more refined ways than that. Please be very interested in this. And so finally, we'll wrap this up with the rather amusing, the, the quite funny truth that that self, that I that wants to be happy must disappear for the mind to be happy until we let go of that self that is trying to be happy there can no the mind will never be happy but by merely letting go of the I the the person who wants to be happy then there arises true happiness this may sound quite illogical but we hope you are beginning to understand. May we end today's talk on this amusing truth. <laughs>